Well, it's a pleasure to be in the Lord's house with you all this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, this morning I'd like to uh, revisit a topic that we talked about a couple of months ago uh, here. Uh, and uh, as Ronnie said, I, I struggled over this uh, a little bit coming back to it, uh, just as I had uh, when I wanted to bring it up at the first. Uh, but this morning in, in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, uh, we're reading a passage about how we're not to keep company with those who are called brothers and yet who continue in sin, in unrepentance. And so if you have your Bibles in 1 Corinthians 5, we'll begin reading in verse 9 together. The scripture says, I write unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you that it works effectually in your people. Uh, Lord, by your Holy Ghost, and we pray that uh, you would send that power to us this morning. Uh, Lord, that your word would work effectually in uh, all of our hearts to tell us what we ought to do in the days ahead. Uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would use us this week to you, uh, for your gospel ministry. Uh, Lord, that you would send someone our way that we can talk to about Christ. And Lord, even this morning, if any are in this place or that listen to the sermon later lost, that you would draw them to be saved. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd be with our missionaries where they are. Uh, Lord, provide for them and all of their needs. Uh, Lord, help us to always keep them in our prayers. And uh, Lord, we pray that we would see them uh, someday once again. We pray that again, where you, we've sinned against you, that, that you would forgive us. And Lord, we ask that you'd keep us safe until the day of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning in our passage, we read about two kinds of company that we can keep as believers. We can keep company with the unbelieving, and we can keep company with the believing. And for both of the, the groups mentioned, it's not only keeping company with the unbelieving and the believing, but the unbelieving who are in sin actively, and those who profess belief who are in sin as well. In verse 9, we read of our keeping company with the unbeliever in their sin. In verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. And in verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also? that are without. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So when he speaks about the unbeliever, when we go out into the world and we see that they have sinned, or a group of unbelievers are in active sin, he says that we don't need to completely withdraw ourselves from their presence. He, he says that even there's necessity in having company with unbelievers. 
In order to live in the world, of course, we have to have dealings with them. Uh, we cannot uh, live in the world unless we uh, get our provisions from the world, uh, from among the world, and those oftentimes come through the unbeliever. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 25, Paul even gives a specific example of drawing our uh, provision from the world and even from uh, the uh, world as it is in sin. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that is in the, the, the market, uh, the meat market, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. And this is in the context of eating meat that was a sacrifice made to a false god. Uh, a, a goat or a calf or a lamb that was brought into the, the pagan place of worship and offered up and slain as a sacrifice and its meat was taken and sold in the market or was brought to be consumed at a feast. Paul says that if this is what is set before you, if this is what is available, if this is what's on sale in the meat market, then you have the liberty to go and eat, to, to buy your food from the unbeliever, even as they are in their sin. And of course, we know that in order to minister to those that are without, to, to give the gospel to them, we have to have company with them. We have to, to go out and communicate with them and speak with them and even be somewhat friendly towards them. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19, Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are un uh, without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Uh, he says that he kept company with these people. That he went out and, and he sought them, and he became to them what he needed to be, that is still remaining under the law of God in his own conscience, he became what he needed to be in order to gain them for the gospel. And this is plainly seen in Jesus' own ministry, how he was in the world. In Matthew 9, 10, it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus became all things to all men that he might by all means save those that were given to him. Jesus kept company with unbelievers and sinners to minister to them. And so we see in our passage that it's permissible uh, to, to keep company with fornicators, idolaters, covetous, if we work with them, if we need them for our provision and for the purpose of sharing the gospel with them. Out of love for them, we suffer with them, we bear with them in order to tell them about Christ and what he's done for them. But also in our passage, we have another group of people. In verse 11, Now I have written unto you not to company, not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. 
For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But when that, but them that are without God, without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. There is a separate judgment here given for a professor, uh, someone who, who says that they know Christ, who says that they're a Christian, who is called of others a Christian. And if they sin in the exact same way as the unbeliever sins, they are to be judged more strictly. It says not even to eat with them, whereas before Paul says that if any an unbeliever bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, go and eat that which is set before you. Here he says not to eat with someone who's called a brother, who, who, who is called a Christian, and is living in this sin. In fact, as much as possible, our dealings with such people ought to be that we rebuke them, we call them to repentance, and more than this, and of course doing so in a loving way, not doing so in an in a, in a, a, in overbearing and, and, and mean-spirited way, but out of love, rebuking them, calling them to repentance, uh, and then to depart from them. Uh, we ought to treat them not only as someone who is without, but someone who is attempting to stay in the, the uh, uh, to, to, to bring their filthiness into the church and, and under the name of, of Jesus Christ, to, to call him uh, as if he approved of them in that sin. People like this are those of whom Christ spoke in Revelation 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent for her, of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This woman Jezebel, who was in the church, who was called a sister in the Lord, who was a false prophetess, who seduced to commit fornication the men in that church, and who called not only to, to eat what was sold in the shambles or what was set before them on uh, the dinner table, but to go and participate in the idol worship, to go in and, and have part in, uh, in that with those that commit such things. And Jesus says, not only will she be punished, but all those who go with her, all those who suffer her to continue in this way, will be cast into her bed and destroyed. In Matthew 23, 13, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. These men who called themselves worshipers of God, who called themselves experts in the law of God, shut up the kingdom of heaven from others. They laid heavy burdens on them. They uh, rejected Christ when he came and the mercy that he offered. And, and Christ says of them, hypocrites. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Religious hypocrites. Christian hypocrites. Paul of them also says in Romans 16, 17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. And they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The simple. And again in Titus 3.10, he says, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of 
himself. When he speaks of uh, those who are called believers, those who are called Christians, and how they sinned, and they bring heresies and, and teach wrong things, he says to reject them, to mark them, to avoid them. Christ says that he will at his coming destroy them, and he calls them hypocrites that we're to have no dealings with apart from the call to repentance. All of these also bring a reproach on Jesus Christ himself and his ministry. In 2 Peter 2 verse 2, speaking of these false prophets, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So we see that gross sin, unrepented of sin, public sin in the life of someone who professes is a cause to break fellowship with that person. To have no dealings with them except for the call of repentance. And so now I'd like to... Uh, turn to some application of all this, just as we did a couple of months ago, in application to the, the wider uh, culture of this uh, Southern Baptist Convention uh, and, and some of the, the horrendous errors that have been brought into it by uh, its leaders. And before we go into that, I'd like us to remember that last verse that we read, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Even the people we'll be talking about are in high places in the Southern Baptist Convention. They have a large degree of influence, and many people follow after that influence. The scripture doesn't say whether people will follow them, whether people will go after their pernicious ways. It says that they will go after their pernicious ways. And it's not a question of whether their teaching and their lifestyle and their wickedness will be an occasion of the way of truth being evil spoken of, but it will be. This will occur in uh, the ministries of these people. As I uh, therefore said uh, a few mo- a couple months ago, I'd like us to look at a few more examples of the SBC. Uh, as, as long as I uh, formatted everything right on my computer, uh, none of the examples that I'm presenting here uh, are the same examples that I presented a couple months ago. These are independent examples of this kind of thing happening in the convention. Let's read again in verse 11, where it says, Now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. There are six offenses that are mentioned in this passage, and I'd just like us to see how many of those uh, the SBC and, and many of the leaders in it uh, measure up to. First, I'd like to look at fornicators, those and those who advocate for such things and, and, and create an environment done. Of course, that being sexual immorality. First, J.D. Greer, the president of the SBC, has said in the recent past that using the preferred pronouns of the gender confused, the the transgender, is using uh, pronoun hospitality, and that it's something that Christians ought to do. That Christians ought to uh, buy into the, the preferred names, the preferred pronouns, the preferred identity of the uh, gender confused individual. Uh, and for the sake of hospitality, play along and act as if they, uh, a man is a woman or that a woman is a man. Again, David Uth, 
who is a gay affirming pastor within the SBC, not outside, but within the SBC, was chosen to be the president of this year's uh, pastors conference. Uh, a, a conference that is dedicated to training pastors. He was set as the president over that, the overseer of that event. Also, in the last half, uh, half of last year, Russell Moore uh, and the uh, ERLC, uh, the, the, the political branch of the SBC, which is again funded in part by the cooperative program, advocated for homosexual man-on-man -man intimacy as a alternative, a, 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 a as an alternative to traditional marriage. Of course, they qualified it saying as long as it doesn't venture into, um, into to, to being a uh, sexually explicit relationship. But nonetheless, permitting these kinds of, of uh, men living with men and uh, having uh, romantic intimacy uh, as an alternative to traditional marriage. The next sin I'd like to look at is the sin of an idolater. And of this, just in the past month, Susan Codone, who is a uh, member and, and part of the leadership of the ERLC, again, uh, she would be paid out of cooperative program funds, and Chris Bolt, who is a blogger of the supposedly conservative side of the SBC, the, the Founders Ministry, uh, not an official entity of the, the SBC to my knowledge, but nonetheless a large ministry within the SBC, uh, which is composed of many influencers within the SBC, they discussed recently on, on Twitter how the heresy of modalism, saying that God is not a trinity, but a single person who is uh, simply pretending to be three different uh, personas or three, uh, showing himself in three different ways, rather than being himself uh, three distinct persons sharing in one essence. They discussed how the heresy of modalism is not forbidden by the Baptist faith and message of 2000. Uh, now, this claim is not true. The, the, the Baptist faith and message does explicitly lay out the doctrine of the Trinity. But nonetheless, they were discussing this and saying that Baptists should not call out other Baptists who... Uh, claim modalism, who, who teach modalism, uh, who are teaching this, this foundational heresy, who are in fact not worshiping God as he's revealed himself, but setting up their own image of what God is and instead worshiping that. There are another two sins mentioned here that I'd like to take together, the covetous and the extortioner. And of course, as I said before, most of these individuals that we've mentioned here uh, are being paid through cooperative program funds. Uh, in fact, they are receiving a salary from churches in order to go out and teach this stuff on the behalf of the churches. Uh, in, in fact, when we send them money, we're paying them to do this stuff. To, to say that man-on-man -man intimacy is, is uh, uh, an acceptable uh, alternative to traditional marriage, that uh, gender pr preferred gender pronouns of the transgendered uh, ought to be adopted by Christians as well as their, their new identity, their new names, uh, that uh, modalism is not under the purview of the, uh, or is, is uh, not excluded by the Baptist faith and message and all that we've uh, spoken about before. In Second Tim, uh, Peter 2, verse 3, it speaks again of them that through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, 
and their damnation slumbereth not. These covetous, these extortioners, they uh, are making merchandise of the church in order to promote these sins. Finally, I'd like to look at the sin of a railer. And about this, uh, these kinds of people who are doing these things, um, they uh, are not only advocating them for themselves, but of course they're um, talking down to those who, who, who would uh, rebuke them for what they're saying, for, uh, to, to try and, and retain uh, traditional biblical Christianity. Uh, again, Russell Moore of the ERLC, he is a, a recurring figure and a, a very influential figure in the SBC. And you know that if, if, if he's like this, then all of his staff uh, or a majority of his staff are uh, like this, uh, has also uh, rebuked uh, those who vote with uh, pro-life values as a, a uh a main issue. Uh, he has said that if you are if if you are voting on the issue of pro life, if you are voting uh, against abortion as a, as a, a primary issue in your voting, uh, then you are uh, alienating yourself from uh, others. In fact, I have the um, the tweet from the ERLC here where they they quoted uh, another. Um, individual with whom they have uh, uh, dealings with. It says, when we make the pro-life agenda a political agenda, we alienate so many people, even many of our own brothers and sisters in the church. We must be more than that. In other words, he's saying, don't vote pro-life, don't vote and don't advocate politically on behalf of the unborn because you might alienate those who don't share that value with you. Uh, and he, they, they've spoken out against, well, me, uh, and, and I'm sure most of you who, who hold these values uh, and are concerned about the unborn. Also, if uh, that weren't enough, of course, they uh, directly speak out against churches who are expressing concerns about what they're doing. And all of this uh, is up, uh, linked with sources under uh, the, the last sermon that I preached on this, and I'll link to that sermon underneath uh, this sermon online. The only sin that's left on here is the sin of a drunkard. Uh, and I uh, haven't spent any time looking into that, but for our purposes, five out of six is enough. It says that if, if any man who is called a brother be a fornicator or an idolater, one or the other, uh, any one of these, it says with such an one know not to eat. And surely I would say with such an one, do not associate with them, do not pay for their uh, salaries, uh, distance yourself from them. And so, believers, this morning, just as I said uh, before, disunity is not a sin when it is against the things of the world, and especially when someone claims to be a Christian and advocates and says these kinds of things. Again, I leave three options set before you. Again, the preferred option for me is to leave the SBC. The second option would be to withdraw all of our monetary support and give it to our missionaries. Give it to, to those ministries that we know and have approved for ourselves. And at the very least, I think that this is imperative. Uh, if we can have unity on one thing, if, if we can do one thing about this, I would at the very least want us to withdraw our cooperative program support until such a time as these issues are resolved. And I know that I cannot continue to support them in good conscience. And then again, finally, we might do nothing and we might continue to sin against the Lord by supporting these 
uh, individuals by associating with them and rather not rebuking them sharply and withdrawing our support from them. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so I pray we would remember this and that we would all look into this and, and prayerfully consider these things until the third Sunday in April where we'll have our regular business meeting. And now if there's an unbeliever here, I'd like you to listen to what your end will be without the grace of God. It may be a little bit of a jump uh, going from this topic to the gospel, but nonetheless, we must go there. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Matthew 7, 23 says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. If you have worked iniquity, as the scripture says you have, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then Christ will say this to you on the last day. He will cast you into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But if you come to him in faith, if you trust on him this morning, if you place your confidence in him as he extends his grace towards you, then you can be saved. And this call goes out to all sinners to as many as have transgressed God's law, including any who have done these things that we've spoken about this morning. John 3, 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Your only hope is to come to Christ and trust in his blood that he will forgive you. And if you do not, it says you are condemned already and you will remain condemned until you are thrown into everlasting fire. And so I pray if there are any lost in here, by the goodness and mercy of God, come to Jesus Christ. And again, believers, let's genuinely consider what we've talked about. And know that there are many more examples even than what I've brought before you in the times that we've had to talk about this. Uh, that there is something very wrong with the Southern Baptist Convention. And I don't think that it is uh, wrong to withdraw our funds, to leave the Southern Baptist Convention. I think that it is imperative that we do something in order to, to make ourselves heard, to, to distance ourselves from that wickedness. And so I, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for uh, this church. Uh, Lord, I thank you for everyone in it, all of our members, even the ones who are not here. Uh, Lord, they're precious to me. Uh, Lord, I thank you for all of the churches in our area that uh, we have friendship with. Uh, Lord, all of your true churches here. Uh, Lord, that we love them. Lord, that we still want fellowship with them. Uh, but, Lord, we pray that they would understand and uh, that uh, what we do, we must do for your truth. Uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us. Uh, Lord, that you'd cleanse us, that you'd make us fit vessels for the gospel. And, Lord, we pray that you would send us out this week to preach the gospel. Lord, give us somebody that we can talk to about Christ. And, Lord, we pray that you'd send your spirit to uh, strengthen us and prosper us in that. Lord, be with our missionaries where they are and the needs that they surely have. Lord, give them whatsoever they ask for your son Jesus Christ's sake. And Lord, we pray that you would send him quickly to the earth to redeem us all from this wickedness. And it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.